cortex in the human brain. They're a good analog for that. So we multiply each of these filters across the image to get the resulting activation. So there are 96 filters, so we get 96 activation outputs. And then we take that and we go through an extra step that's unique to, to AlexNet. And what this step actually does is it um, amplifies and selects the dominant features that are then fed in to the following network. We're going to continue to apply all the way through these weight networks as we fly through the, the network until we get to a fully connected layer. So each of these is in, increasing its abstraction, sort of how deep the feature descriptor is and what its parts look like. And the first fully connected layer is going to take those parts and begin to mix them together. So, as we continue to fly through, we're going to shift so you can see the output vector here. In this case, this is the output result, this histogram, that high dimensional vector, thousand dimensional vector. So if we take our bunny, this is the output of bunny. So you can see that really strong bar. So it turns out that the, the classes here of bunnies are put together. It's actually an aura, but the network actually understands even subspecies of rabbits. For example, we get a dog through, as Jensen says, there's lots of species of dogs, so we get a lot of activations, but we get a few in, in particular. So this is actually a mixed breed, which is why it has a couple of very bright, bright bars in it. Does anybody know what that dog was? So, and here's a koala. So the koala's an interesting one um, because the network actually struggles here. It gets koala as the highest output. But if you look at all the other ones, you get things like squirrel and other types of sort of small, small mammals. And similarly with a cat, you kind of get a, you know, a similar sense where it's still grouped sort of in mammals, which is why you still get that sort of histogram chunk there. Um, but again, there's multiple subspecies of cats. So that's taking a fully trained network and going through and seeing how it outputs things. So let's switch and look at actually training the network from scratch. Now before, before, like before you start, remember, this is how the network starts. It's a bunch of random numbers in it, and it's largely unprogrammed. I and mean, all, all that's been done here is that the architecture, the architecture, which of course I'm not understanding about, about imaging and such, the architecture, of the network was designed by the engineers. The architecture of it was designed. Um, how, how many layers of the convolution? How many layers of convolution networks um, before you you uh, you apply them to the fully connected layers? Uh, how how wide and how deep are these convolution networks? All of those parameters were somehow engineered were engineered somehow by the by the uh, by the data scientists. And but it starts out it starts out not able to recognize anything. Go ahead. So, so we're going to start from blank slate, as Jensen said, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start pumping lots and lots of images through. We'll push those through the network and we'll get a result. The result will be wrong. It'll modify that result and then back propagate and basically correct all the error through as we go. So if we watch to put in images, what's amazing is how fast those features in the front actually form. Those, those edge filters form almost instantly and they maintain fairly stable. So this is an interesting property of these networks. The remaining training actually happens in, in the much later layers. What's happening is, as the accuracy increases, the learning rate is decreasing, so the rate of change is also decreasing. So we actually reach the point where the human eye actually can no longer see changes because we're so minute in the network. 